Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. We're so <laughs> like sometimes I'm like there, and then sometimes my mind is like totally in a different, faraway place. But my mind, it was there. No, it's it's okay. You know, it's funny. I was um, I pray the rosary all the time, but you know, being on a live live chat with like almost 500 other people, I was like, don't forget the creed. Don't forget the creed. Don't. I know. I know. But I pushed through. We did it. <laughs> it, it, yeah it's it's a little nerve-wracking yeah it is it's all good <laughs> um, it's all good um so paul would you mind uh sharing your rosary story with us like maybe a time when the rosary has really impacted your life or when you how you first learned the rosary or yeah. maybe a pivotal point in your life after praying it you started praying it yeah, it's funny because growing up as a Catholic, I didn't like going to church. I, I tell this a lot to my audience. <laughs> I went for girls and donuts. Um, so as long as there were cute girls at mass and donuts afterwards. And so I was totally checked out as a Catholic. I've been raised with Catholic values all my life. I just, I hadn't really been evangelized, you know? I hadn't met Jesus. And it seems so simple, yeah, that um, that one Catholic would know who Jesus was. But I, I just knew things about him. I didn't know him in my heart. And so uh, the joke is that when someone says, uh, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I was like, no, I'm Catholic. Why would I have that? Uh, <laughs> of course we need to have a personal relationship with Jesus. I do think the disciples' lives were changed. You know? <laughs> and so, you know, there's that. But um, so I went to a conference in high school called Steubenville. Maybe some people are aware of their mission, but Francis University of Steubenville is a great um, university in Ohio. I actually graduated from there later on. But prior to that moment, I went as a high schooler and I had this amazing encounter with Jesus and um, I was taught how to pray the rosary. Uh, before then, I thought the rosary was a medieval device of torture, which made people so bored out of their minds that all they could do is, <laughs> you know, I had this very negative connotation of the rosary, right, right. It's just too long, you know. Right, right. Um, but whatever the case, I, I went to college. I went to UCLA uh, in Los Angeles, California, and you would think that after this encounter with Jesus, my life did a complete 180. No, it did a complete 360. That means it, it ended up back to where it was before, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I wanted to major in, in all things, just partying and just kind of the pursuit of pleasure and hedonism. And that was kind of my major in, in college. And, um, you know, I was kind of living this double life, but it's funny, call it Catholic guilt or whatever you want, but I'd go back to my dorm room and I'd pray the rosary. And I'd wait till all my doormates were out of the room and I'd kneel next to my bed and I'd, for 20 minutes, I'd, I'd pray the rosary and I'd meditate on the mysteries of Christ. And, you know, in those 20 minutes of prayer, I felt more peace, joy, and purpose than I did from a month's worth of screwing around. And so oddly, um, yeah, I, I was being mysteriously drawn to my faith as a Catholic, and especially to the intercession of Our Lady. Um, and, you know, as many of your followers here, I'm sure have experienced firsthand, uh, the mother of Jesus has a really firm grip, you know, it, <laughs> it's yeah. really hard to um, simultaneous live um, a double life. You have to be a, a real psychotic to do it. And I wasn't uh, that crazy enough. Um, so slowly but surely I was being influenced by Our Lady to start being authentic. And so I remember it very clearly. Um, I'd be praying the rosary. I'd, I'd feel the presence of God. I feel this peace and joy in my heart. And I'd feel her presence, which was really interesting. Uh, there were a handful of times where I'd start smelling roses out of nowhere. Um, and it wasn't because I was praying next to a rose bush or an older lady with too much rose perfume. It was because uh, the mother of Jesus was manifesting her presence. And to me, it was clear. I knew it was Mother Mary. And I knew that when I prayed, she was there with me. I knew that she was leading me to her son, Christ, and that's what she did. I, I was led back to the sacraments. Um, uh, particularly, I was inspired to make what's called a general confession. And so for those of you who don't know what that is, if, you know, it's, it's when you, you basically go through your entire life and think of all the, the serious sins and you just bring that before God, you know. 
don't do this on a Saturday. You know, make an appointment with your priest because usually you'll take up the whole lot. <laughs> At least I did. <laughs> And so I remember, you know, typing up all my sins on my computer. Uh, it's like a page and a half, single space, 12-point font. It was a lot of sins. <laughs> Printed this thing out, went to my, you know, campus ministry priest, and was like, uh, Father, could you, could you hear my sins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hear my confession? Yeah. Like, oh, sure, son. You know, I sit down, I roll, <laughs> I take out this page and a half. It felt like a scroll rolling down the street. Yeah. I'm like, this is going to be a long one, Father. <laughs> Chapter one, infancy, you know. <laughs> And so, that's great. Yeah, you know, just said my confession, and it was just powerful. Yeah. I heard those beautiful words, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It was all washed away. And after that, I, I wanted to go even deeper. So I found myself at Mass on a, on a Monday or a Tuesday, I think it was. And I mean, at that point, I just thought I went all radical. You know, it was me and like all of our grandmas, right? <laughs> The median age was like 85. I brought it back to like 79, you know, by my presence. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not 100% sure what I was looking for. I just wanted to be close to Jesus. And I went to Mass like I did thousands of other times throughout my life. And, um, you know, at consecration on that particular weekday, um, yeah, just God rocked my face. Uh, <laughs> he just started ugly crying. It's like, my spirit was seeing something that my eyes weren't attuned to for most of my life. And, um, yeah, from then on, it was just game over. Um, St. John Bosco had a famous vision. He had, he was blessed with a lot of visions throughout his life. And one of his most famous visions was one of the church. And it was represented as a boat at sea. You know, the, the Holy Father was at the, the helm. And, you know, it was being attacked by enemies left and right. It was about to sink. It was about to get shipwrecked. And then out of the middle of the ocean arose two pillars. And on top of one pillar was our blessed Lord in the Eucharist. And on the other pillar was the blessed mother. And once the ship anchored itself between those two pillars, the, the sea calmed, the enemies departed, and the church was able to remain steadfast in uh, its mission and its victory. And, you know, that's obviously a, uh, some sort of a prophecy for the universal church, but even in my own life as a Catholic, I've, I've seen how that vision has played a huge role in my life in Christ, where once my life became anchored, if you will, between those two pillars, the Eucharist, you know, not just Sunday Mass, you know, it's not just a holy day of application, it's a, it's a holy day of opportunity, right. and, and frankly, right. you can go okay. any day during the week, and... Right. I mean, receiving communion frequently, well, I mean, what closer way, what greater way is there to be united to the Lord, you know, spiritually? And so going to, to Mass more frequently and then praying the rosary throughout my life, I mean, that has grounded me, you know. It's anchored me and it's it's changed my life. I mean, I've, I've seen, yeah, I mean, numerous sins and I dare even say like addiction is just like melt and and die. <laughs> I've, I've received so many praises. I mean, how many prayers have been answered through the intercession of Our Lady? Um, so, I mean, I can't say enough about it. It's something that I still pray regularly. Um, I, I pray with my wife and occasionally my, my kids when they're in the back of the minivan. <laughs> you know, I'll be a yet. Then they're locked in, right? They can't yeah, go seriously. Yeah. But, you know, devotion to Our Lady is um, just a sure sign, as many saints have said it, of, um, uh, of God's favor on a soul. And um, nothing is really merited in the, in the Christian life. You know, it doesn't make anyone more special than another. It's just mercy. You know, Jesus gave us his mom, and, and that's all it is. It's, it's just a huge gift. Um, so, yeah, that's just kind of my my little rosary testimony and uh, you know, I'm I'm touched by all the the hundreds of people who join you at this this hour in the morning when I'm usually asleep. So, uh, <laughs> are you asleep? But, but well, you're on Central Time now, right? I am in Central Time. Yeah, yeah. But my kids usually sleep in, you know, later, and so uh, my wife and I we capitalize on those moments <laughs> as much as we can, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, but, this can because I had written out like my perfect day. It, I did this like two years ago, but 
And I wrote like, I want to start my day in prayer. And I want to start it with the rosary because I'm like ADHD and I can't like, I, it's hard for me to like focus, period. So like the, mm -hmm. the, the rosary helps with that. And so I had written down like, start day in prayer. And then <laughs> this kind of happened. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, you have accountability now. There's a lot of people. <laughs> exactly. <The thing. laughs> are like, Where's Kristen? Yeah, Where is she? <laughs> I need to pay um, my rosary. <laughs> exactly. But that's that, it, your story is so beautiful and so relatable. I think that a lot of us, especially like in our youth, I felt very similar. Like I, I was searching, but I didn't really understand any of it. And I don't know if it's like I just wasn't ready or, you know, I saw my parents live out the faith. But even though I went to Catholic schools, every other kid, it was kind of like, you know, nobody else was interested. And so I don't know. Right. I didn't really see it lived until college. And then that's where I felt it a little bit more. But I think we also don't, no one really taught me prayer, right? Mm -hmm. Like nobody taught me like you you can talk to God all day long and this is how you do it. Or right. it's just more like these are the sacraments and they're explained to you, but the relationship side with God through Mary, I felt like was never really explained. That. Yeah. You know, I mean, statistically speaking, you have what 20 minute, 15 minute homily once a week on Sundays. And, uh, and usually, you know, God bless our priests, they're just trying to focus on the gospel message. And I mean, scripturally, there's not a whole lot that's said about Our Lady. I mean, we have a handful of feast days throughout the liturgical year where it's dedicated to the Mother of God. Um, and a lot of those aren't even like holy days of obligation. And so naturally, like most Catholics aren't going to really understand Mary. And, you know, naturally, when when non-Catholics ask silly questions like, why do you worship Mary? We're like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, yeah, sadly. Yeah. There's just a lack of, we don't worship her. Um, if you want to get really nerdy and technical theologically, we offer her hyperdulia, um, <laughs> super nerdy Latin term. Um, so, it, you know, the understanding of the, these words in Latin, latria is the worship that's given to God and God alone, right? That's, that's afforded to God. You know, to the saints, we offer dulia, which is ven veneration. And to the mother of Jesus is a special type of veneration called hyperdulia, which is, you know, reserved for her alone because she received singular favors from God. And not only that, but she was the premier disciple, right? Um, she showed us the way um, so much so that her body was assumed into heaven. Like she, she's that like great and she would be the first to proclaim that my spirit rejoices in God, my spirit my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. And so, I mean, she'd be the first one to, to basically recognize that everything she received is purely a gift from God. And I love the analogy by St. Louis de Montfort, who was um, obviously one of the huge proponents of Marian devotion, if you haven't read True Devotion to Mary. But he gave the analogy that God, Jesus, is like the sun, right? The source of light, the radiance. Um, Mary is like the moon, right? If you look at the moon at night, you're not seeing an object um, emanating light by itself. It's reflecting the light that is, the, the moon is reflecting the light of the sun, right? And so Mary oftentimes is referred in that way. She reflects so purely the light of the sun. And another great analogy is um, she has a title, Star of the Sea. And, you know, it, in sailing terms, and I'm certainly not a sailor, I get seasick terribly. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm going to close my blinds here. The sun is rising in Austin, Texas. <laughs> um, but she's often given that term or that title of Star of the Sea. And, you know, when sailors would get lost in, in the night as they were sailing their ships, they would have the, the North Star or the Star of the Sea to be their guide. And the mother of Jesus has often been given that term star of the sea as a spiritual reference that when we feel lost, when we lose our way, where is she leading us? Is she leading us to herself? No, she's leading us to her son, right? John chapter two, verse five, do whatever he tells you. 
you know, if she had a tombstone, which she doesn't because she's been assumed into heaven, <laughs> that would be her motto. Do whatever he tells you. I mean, that's it. That, that's her mission statement. You know, she wants to lead us to Jesus. She wants us to be ever more faithful to him. She wants us to also magnify the greatness of the Lord with our lives. And she's good like that. And, um, you know, to those who maybe have wondered, if, if I give attention to Our Lady, if I, if I spend so much time honoring her, will it somehow like offend God? Could I somehow lose my way in honoring Our Lady? Now, granted, if, if Catholics all throughout the world were surveyed, would there be a possibility that maybe some have an incorrect theology or misunderstanding of Our Lady's role? Or maybe they are borderline kind of treating her in a worship kind of way or superstitious, perhaps, perhaps. But when the mother of Jesus is properly understood in our life of faith, um, once again, she is not the creator. She is a creature, but she has been given so many amazing favors and blessings from God. And not only that, but on the cross, right? One of the final things that Christ said last dying words was, son, behold your mother, and mother, behold your son. And spiritually, you know, St. John, the beloved disciple, represents all of us. And so, you know, when Jesus gave the mother of Jesus to him and vice versa, that was very personal, but that was very real. She became the spiritual mother of us all. And um, so when people worry, well, in honoring her, will I somehow dishonor God? And the answer is no, 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 no. <laughs> um, because uh, I love this analogy. You know, were you to go to a museum and see an amazing work of art, right, masterpiece, and say a person was unaware that the artist was even present in the museum, and yet out loud, you know, just this person was just emoting the joy at seeing this work of art. This is incredible. This is the most beautiful work of art I've seen. You know, would the artist be offended that the person wasn't praising him for creating the work of art. Right. No, in praising the work of art, naturally, who's receiving the praise? It's the right. artist. Exactly. And yeah. so, in the words of St. Maximilian Kolbe, who also was a huge devotee of Our Lady, he, I, and I paraphrase, he said, don't ever worry about giving too much honor to Mary because you'll never be able to do more than what Jesus did. Right. I mean, all the graces she received, the Immaculate Conception, the mother being becoming the mother of God, becoming assumed into heaven, being a perpetual virgin, yet having a child. How does that work? Right. Uh, the coronation of that queen of heaven and earth. I mean, you know, everything in her life is a gift and a favor from God. And she'd be the first to proclaim that. So, um, you know, and these are kind of like epic titles, and it might sound really overwhelming to people, but really, she's just your mom. Yeah. <laughs> she's your mom. That's right. <laughs> you know, when my wife, God bless her, you know, when we when we were dating, she wasn't Catholic, and uh, I remember having really intense, like, theological conversations with her about faith. Wow. And one of the hangups for many non-Catholics is the Blessed Mother. You know, the Eucharist is pretty simple. I mean, when you pointed out, it's like John 6. I mean, it's like so clear, right? <laughs> that he's talking about his flesh and blood. But the mother of Jesus, she's mysterious. You know, there's only a handful of verses in scripture. And without proper understanding of both Old Testament and New Testament, she's a real mystery. So the church has, throughout the centuries, like developed Marian theology. And they, they've been able to understand her based on those revelations from God about her title, her role, her, who she is. So anyways, I'm trying to like convey this to my, my poor girlfriend at the time. And <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the, in the Old Testament, there's the Ark of the, the Old Covenant. And she's, she's the Ark of the New Covenant. And here's why. And, and, and you know, this is what happened in the Immaculate Conception. And, yeah. and at the end of this conversation, I'm like, is this helpful? And she's like, uh, yeah, yeah, kind of. Uh, and so, like, I think the Holy Spirit just kind of uh, inspired me in that moment, you know, after all my rambling. And I'm just like, you know, have you ever talked to her? And she's like, no, why would I ever talk to her? Right, yeah. 
I'm like, well, you know, and I, I basically explained that when Jesus was dying on the cross, he gave her to us as a mother and how comforting she must have been to the early Christians, you know, when Jesus ascended back into heaven. and There she was as a sign uh, of all that God had done, not only for her, but for them. And, you know, she was there at Pentecost praying with them um, throughout the rest of her life. And I'm like, did you, have you ever talked to her? And she's like, I don't know what to even say. I'm like, what would you say to the best of moms? What would you ask? You know, how would you just be in the presence of the most tender and the most loving of all moms out there, the greatest of all time? Yeah. I'm like, would you like to pray to her? And she's like, yeah, sure, I'll try. And, you know, she said a prayer, a very simple, beautiful prayer, just from the heart. That's what prayer is, right? It's, it's, right. Exactly. it's really just praying from the heart. You know, sometimes and this isn't a knock on the rosary. This isn't downplaying its role, but I think sometimes as Catholics, we get into this autopilot mode of, right. boy, if I pray the right formula in yeah. the right way <laughs> with the right intention, Jesus right. will hear my novena prayer, right? I don't know why I just became a Scottish person, but, <laughs> you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with these forms of prayer, but if we forget that prayer has to be a matter of the heart that I'm lifting my mind and my heart to God and I'm speaking truth. I'm not just speaking truth, but I'm recognizing truth. I'm, I'm speaking as a child does to his or her father. And in this sense, to Our Lady, to his or her mother. And uh, my wife, my girlfriend at the time, prayed this beautiful prayer from the heart. And she's emotional, right? She started crying. You know, for men, understanding why women cry is oftentimes a great mystery, right? This time it was pretty clear to me, like, God gave me the sense. What's wrong, honey? What's wrong? I don't know how to help you. What, what do I do? I, you're mysterious to me. Um, and I asked her, what, what are the tears about? And she, she explained that, um, you know, she was just so touched by Our Lady's presence that she got the sense of the spiritual mother who he, she had never known, but who had loved her so much. And it was just a real grace for her in that moment. And um, it's funny because that was a feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, December 12th. Um, that was the day we were having this conversation in this moment. And, you know, throughout her life of faith, my wife, um, because she later became Catholic and she received like five sacraments in one year because she had to been baptized. Um, yeah, I saw how even Our Lady was working in her life. And, um, you know, gosh, I, I could say so much more, you know, but yeah, yeah, the mother of Jesus has really, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know why, but it, it, it's like she's made so much effort to come into my life with the sole desire to lead me to her son, you know, so I, I owe her. <laughs> <laughs> and um you know even still you know because even even at the end of the day when we've been walking with the lord and i'm sure there's many people here have been walking with the lord for decades right who've been faithful and who have just showed up each day you know in service to god throughout their life you know like it's living saints sort of you know these people are very close to god even for them at the end of the day you know, what are we but children? Um, you're a parent. I'm a parent. You know, yeah. there's a lot of parents here. I have three kids. I have one on the way in September. And uh, we also have one in heaven through miscarriage, you know. So you have a saint in heaven. But, you know, raising kids, it's like, man, God speaks to me through my kids all the time. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, in it's good cool. moments yeah. and in ugly moments. Like, yeah. oh, my gosh. Like. Yeah. I'll be like telling my kids, don't do that. That's not good for you. Why would you do? And and God's like, that's what you do, Paul. I'm like, ugh, why? Not right now, God. You know, <laughs> but it's, 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 yeah, it's so true. Like this spiritual childhood, um, you know, most of us, we just struggle being childish, but like God speaks about how we must become like little children and, some sense there will always remain children totally needy totally helpless without the grace of god there go i i mean without me you can do nothing and it's like you know i mean we're adults i mean i'm 
I'm almost 40. I'm 30, 37. I mean, I still look okay because I have Asian genes, but you know what I'm saying? It's like still so like I, I can't do this without the grace of God. I can't even like persevere in my faith for a day without the grace of God. And even when I struggle and I stumble and I fall, it's still the grace of God that picks me back up. And so I think it's healthy. It's good for us to, um, to have this relationship, not only with the Lord, but with our lady, just to be reminded that we have a father in heaven, but we also have a spiritual mother, you know, and it's good. It's great to be Catholic because we, we have this huge spiritual family and what a gift, you know, what a joy. And, uh, I can't wait to meet everybody in heaven, you know, give them some hugs. Be like, wait, you look way different than that statue I had seen of you. <laughs> <laughs> this was like, this was so amazing. I already have like so many notes and tidbits of wisdom. So um, would you come back and we can talk? I really want to talk to you about the, um, your last post on the dating. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be helpful to some of them with for the rosary again and then <laughs> sure. but a few people did ask about your wife how's she feeling and doing oh god bless them they must know about our family details because of social media <laughs> <laughs> i know it's so odd right right it's like uh strangers come up to me how's the pregnancy going i'm like how do you even know me i'm like wait <laughs> social media ah. yeah it's no, it's good. That's really that's really thoughtful for people to ask. Um, she's doing well. She's obviously uncomfortable. You know, if anyone out there is pregnant, it's kind of a it's kind of a thing. Yeah, and it's <laughs> kind of a thing. I'm grateful that I don't have to endure. I just get to be supportive and help yes. her. And, yes. um, but no, she's healthy. The baby's healthy. We're uh, currently trying to figure out what to name the boy, and um, we uh, have a couple of names in mind but we haven't decided on one yet. Yeah. So it's an exciting time. Um, and you just moved, right? Yeah, we moved from uh, Southern California to, from Anaheim, California to the Austin, Texas area. So we are Texans. Yes. Track, America. How do you like it so far? You know, we love it. Um, the weather sucks, but yeah. <laughs> everything else is great. I mean. Uh, I think it, it'll, right, come fall, it'll. Yeah, it'll, it'll get more mild, and then it actually becomes reasonably cold in the winter, and then, yeah. you know, the, the wonders of spring. And, yeah. You know, so awesome. we're in the middle of the beginning of summer, and uh, yeah. but no, it's yeah. been wonderful, and that's a whole other testimony unto itself, um, but essentially during COVID, uh, right before COVID, actually, uh, we were, yeah, we were just praying um, for God's guidance uh, for whether or not to stay in California or to move. We had been thinking about it, but it wasn't until a couple of things we found out my, we were pregnant with our fourth. Yeah. So our family's growing. And then my daughter, my oldest daughter, Audrey, she's about to start school. And, uh, you know, we were big fans of California public school system. And yeah. we also didn't want to pay a premium to send her to Catholic school, you know, and yeah. my wife, God bless her. She's trying to homeschool and that's like difficult. That's uh, yeah. And so we're like, eh, what do we do? So we prayed a novena. We prayed a novena to St. Joseph, and we asked for God's guidance on whether or not to stay in California at the time or to move to Texas. And we started praying this novena, and I'm not even kidding you. Like, we received, like, four signs that were just abundantly clear related to Texas. Yeah, and specifically to Austin, the Austin area. Wow. So, um, yeah, you that's the your family in Austin or? No, we have no family out here. Our, all of our families back in California. So that was definitely part of the struggle. Right. Yeah, we had grown up in California, you know, oh. the beach, the mountains, in and out Burger, right? <laughs> sort right. of thing. Yes. So it was, yeah, it was a struggle. But, you know, when, when God had been so gracious with answering our prayers, because, you know, we, we pray and we ask for signs at times, you know, for big decisions. But it's not always that God shows these kind of big signs, yeah? Like, he doesn't always confirm in such clear ways. But this time, it was like he was, for lack of better terms, you know, it's what the youngsters say nowadays. God was flexing. You know, he was, he was flexing. He Is was, that what they say? Flex. Yeah, he was, but he was giving, like, extra reasons why he's so awesome and great. Like, but he answered our prayers, like, three or four times. Like, he gave us so many clear signs. 
And um, awesome. that for us was like, uh oh, we prayed and now God has answered. So do we obey or not obey? Yeah. Right. It was it was literally one of those things. Yeah. We had a so, very similar. It's amazing when you get the big sign. It's really thank you. But now, am I gonna like move? Am I yeah, gonna move forward with right. this? Right. Uh oh. And so, um, anyways, we um, we had to. I mean, we didn't have to. We could have said no. Yeah. But when you say no to God, that can be kind of a really stupid thing to do. <laughs> because as humans, I mean, what do we know? Nothing. Like, I know what I'm going to do right now. I literally don't know what's going to happen in five minutes, you know, let alone for the rest of my life. Right. And so when we prayed this prayer, it was like, God, you know the future of our family. You know what our family needs. You know what I need. You know my, what my wife needs. Um, you know what might happen or not happen if we're in a geographical location. So when God said to us very clearly, multiple ways, like move to Texas, we're like, okay, Jesus, I trust in you, right? It was an opportunity for us to do like St. Joseph. And the reason I subconsciously chose him was because, you know, he had to uproot his family nonstop, right? I don't, you know, I've gotten to know St. Joseph this year in a really beautiful way. And, he doesn't really get enough credit. I think like everyone who's devoted to Our Lady must become devoted to St. Joseph. Why? Because they're a, they're a combo package. They're married. Yeah. You know, you can't, you can't separate one from the other, right? And I mean, God bless Joseph. He, um, he said nothing in scripture. There's literally no quotes of him. But his, his presence and his example are so powerful because when he heard the voice of God, he just simply obeyed it. He listened to it. He responded. You know, he wasn't sure if he was going to take Mary as his wife because of this whole like, you know, miraculous virginal pregnancy thing. And he doesn't know, right? And um, he wakes up out of this dream where the angel of God tells him, "Take Mary as your wife," and he just wakes up and obeys, right? And then it's like uh, Herod wants to kill Jesus, you know. Get out of this town. Go to another one. Oh, and by the way, it's not down the street. You can't drive there. You're going to walk like 100 plus miles. Go. And he just goes. I know. You know, can you imagine like, oh, yeah, your wife's about to give birth. You had planned it out at your house, but you're in a foreign town now. And now you have to knock on doors. Go do it. You know, I mean, it's like as a father, it's like I can't imagine how stressful those moments must have been for him. Yeah. And yet, you know, Mary gave her fiat, her, you know, yes, Lord, I will serve. And Joseph simultaneously was doing that as well. I didn't know this, but um, if you haven't read the book by Father Donald Calloway, he wrote a book called Consecration of St. Joseph. Highly recommend it. Very beautiful. But he was sharing the fact that um, actually a number of points really touched me. But St. Joseph's yes was just as important in some sense as Mary's yes was, not because you know, his merits are greater or less than Our Lady. But, you know, um, like when God prophesied, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years before, um, Jesus was to be born of the house of David, right? Joseph came from the house of David. If he didn't take Mary as his wife, then how would Jesus would have been born from the house of David? You see, like there's prophecies that were lined up thousands of years before that Joseph had to also fulfill. Um I never put two and two together, but there's Joseph of the Old Testament, right? Joseph, who had been given the Technicolor dream coat, yeah, yeah, who yeah. had been uh, favored by his father, but abandoned, almost killed by his own brothers, right? And what happens to that Joseph in the Old Testament? He actually becomes a slave. He uh, gets transplanted into Egypt. He becomes the second highest ranking person in all of Egypt. And what was his role? He distributed the grain the grain in Egypt, like he protected the food supply. Mm -hmm. In fact, Pharaoh, one of his quotes in scripture, you know, was go to Joseph. Like people were asking for petitions and favors and Pharaoh said, go to Joseph. And in Catholic tradition, that's often that quote is used for Joseph, St. Joseph, you know, in the new Testament, go to Joseph with your prayers. But linking those two together, the old Testament and the new Testament, why, why is that so powerful? Because think about it, Joseph in the New Testament, right, the spouse of Mary, he was also sent to Egypt, right? 
And who was he protecting? Not the grain, but the bread of life, Jesus Christ. Like he was in charge of protecting the grain, which gives us eternal life. And um, it's incredible. Like he literally, he saved the savior, right? Throughout his life. He was the father of the son of God on earth. Like wrap your head around that. Yeah. And um, his, his example is so beautiful. So anyways, like, we turned to him in prayer, and I was just so humbled that St. Joseph would pull so many strings to help us to get, one, the answer we needed from God. But then once we sold the house, I'm sorry, once we um, figured out we needed to move, what happens? COVID happens, right? All hell breaks loose in 2020, <laughs> right? What's next? Aliens? Yeah. Yeah. Aliens from outer space? Like, what's next, For everybody? <laughs> yeah. So and I didn't so, know um, this, but they put, a, they put a time limit on it. They told us we have 30 seconds remaining. Oh, okay. So we got a piece out. What so happened? You'll have, to, you'll have to come back. This has never happened before. Yeah, it's because I'm talking so much. But anyways. No, but I love hey, it. Oh, God bless everyone. Thank you so much, Kristen. Really appreciate you inviting me. Um, yes. If people want to come say hello, you can just click on my little account there. Hey, PJK. And uh, I'd love to journey with you guys me. in faith. Yeah, Stop please pray you. for me. You you yes. are all prayerful people waking up at very odd hours in the morning. Please pray for me and my family.